Put your hand together and let's welcome uh, Sister Marilyn Newbauer today. And um, as she's coming right now, I just want to remind you, she also had books at the back of the hall. All right, all those books that she had wrote. Uh, please, before you leave today, grab one, two, five, whatever <laughs> you want to do. All right, we accept all, everything. Checks, credit card, all right, cash. Uh, grab one book. <laughs> I know you will be blessed. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, it's great to be back here. And uh, thank you for Pastor Daniel and Connie for having me. Where is Pastor Connie? Oh, thank you for, <laughs> for having me come. It's an honor to be here, and I am thrilled to share the word of the Lord with you. And I will say something about the back table. <clears throat> I actually like to call it a tool table instead of a product table because, you know, when a carpenter builds a house, he has to use tools. Well, we have to build our faith every day, so it's a tool table back there for building your faith. So I have back there, it's a scripture packet with a lot of healing uh, scriptures in there and a, a prayer card. Uh, teaching you how to pr actually pray the word for your healing. This is something new that I have. It's called <clears throat> The Battle is the Lord's. It's a laminated card. It fits right into your Bible. We all have battles sometimes, right? Well, the battle belongs to the Lord. That's what it starts out with. And then it says, Therefore, speaking to the Lord, Therefore, Lord, you deliver me from the snare of the fowler. You deliver me from unreasonable attacks. You break down that wall of separation. You laugh at the plots of the wicked. You give me wisdom and knowledge. You enlighten my understanding. You make a way in the wilderness. You make the crooked places straight. You multiply my seed sown. You rebuke the devourer. You give angelic ascent that you cover me with your blood. It goes on and on and on what God does. And then it says, therefore I, my part is, I shall enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. And then on this backside are all praise scriptures. So, and it fits just perfect in your Bible. But it's just something good just to have on hand. Amen. This is a book that I've written. It's called Guidelines, Praying for the Sick. And it's a very powerful book because it's got quite a few chapters in there. But it also talks about God's will and his ways for healing. And then it talks about why some don't receive healing. So it's a very powerful book. And not just for if you're on a prayer ministry for praying for the sick. But it's something that you need to know every day because we all have opportunities to pray for somebody who needs healing. Amen. Uh, this book, I've had this here before, it's Instructions from the Great Physician. It actually went number one on Amazon in two categories, the Christian category and the New Age people. Love. <laughs> I thought, praise the Lord. They want to know who this, is, who this great physician is. So, you know, it is God's word. You know, one thing I always say about God's word is different than man's medicine. God's word is medicine to our flesh. But man's medicine has negative side effects. God's medicine has no negative side effects. So you could never, ever overdose. So you, you can just take all that you need, all that you need. This you're probably familiar with. This is a laminated card designed to go in the bathroom shower. That's why it's laminated. So there's scriptures on both sides for health and wealth. And the Bible says that God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So you don't want to wait to the end of the day to light your path when you can do it while you're shampooing your hair. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> so Patrick, no excuse, right, Pastor? No excuse. Now, this is my latest book. <clears throat> it's called My Three Miracles, The Journey. Uh, some of you have heard my healing testimony, but I shared in this book the journey because there's always going to be a journey. And so this book will really uh, be a, an encouragement to you. And then my other book, <clears throat> I wrote this when I lived in Switzerland. It's called My Daily Delight in the Lord. And the first chapter it talks about intimacy with the Lord. And then there's chapters for uh, praying as an ambassador for the Lord, praying for your family, pray, praying for your nation, healing for finances. It's a daily delight in the Lord. But I love the part about developing intimacy with the Lord. You know, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's a secret place where secrets are revealed in the secret place. And those are secrets that he wants us to know about. So we have to take that time to get into that secret place. You know, the Apostle Paul said, my determined purpose is that I might know him, that I might, be, I might progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. I want to be intimate with him. And that's, that's what makes the difference is that intimacy. And if the apostle Paul said, that's my determined purpose, 
that ought to be our testimony as well. Amen. So I just wanted to share those few things. And then if you ever want to be in partnership with my ministry, there's a partnership in the back there. Uh, can I just give this to you, Rick or Colleen, just to hold on to those? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Sure, about half of it. That's good. Thanks. Well, I'm excited to share the word with you today. I believe this will be a great blessing to you. <clears throat> you know, some of you, maybe there's been a time in your life where you've, you've wondered, hmm, why is the word not really working for me? It just seems like the word isn't working for me. You ever feel, feel like that? Or maybe, hmm, maybe I'm just, where am I missing it? Am I missing it someplace? I think we've all kind of felt that way from time to time. Well, <clears throat> over the last 25 years, more than that, actually, I have traveled over 50 countries preaching the gospel. And in doing so, I have been exposed to many different cultures. And the language in those cultures is very vital because that's how I'm going to be able to communicate with these people is through the language of their culture. So it's very important that I have an excellent interpreter so that they will accurately hear the message that I'm bringing to them. Amen. So today, I'm going to show you some illustrations that I think will really enhance my message. So, um, Brian, if we can look at that first scripture, I don't, yeah, we might have to dim the lights a little bit. So, we're going to look at different cultures. Obviously, you can tell this is the African culture. Would you agree? <laughs> so, the picture on the left, these are men that have a lot of red on them, and these are warriors. And they are protecting their livestock from the lions because this, is, this was in lion territory. And this is Maasai tribe, the Maasai tribe. And the Maasai tribe, they live in mud huts like this. Now, if you were to be closer into Nairobi, you can see through the sticks of their home. But in Maasai land, they're more like mud huts because they have to protect themselves from the, the wildlife and also from other tribes, tribes that do warring. Uh, the language that they speak... There's many different dialects in Africa, but in, in, in Maasai land, they speak the language called Maasai. But other parts of Africa, they speak Swahili. So when I'm in that nation and I'm in um, Maasai land, I have to have two translators, from English into Swahili and then Swahili into Maasai. And I have written here in Swahili, it says, Yesu Anakapende, and that means Jesus loves you. But that is the culture of the African tribe, and those are warriors. Their uniform is quite different than you would see in the American warriors, right? So now let's look at the next slide. This is the Hispanic culture, and I did a lot of work way 10 hours up the mountains from Guatemala City, and I worked in an orphanage up there. We had a feeding program of over 600 children, and they were located in five different areas. And uh, one time we had to travel on horseback to get to all the different locations where the, where the kids were. And we had to, uh, our, the bridges were washed out, so we're going on horseback. And I told my team, it would behoove you to do some horseback riding uh, classes <laughs> before we go because we're going to be all day on horses. And they're not going to be Tennessee walkers. They're going to be old gray mares that we have to borrow from the local farmer. So, but uh, at the feeding program, we, we feed all these children. And so these women came to help in the feeding program. And if you can see, they're on the floor. Now, that's quite different. If, I, if my culture, if I had to do my dishes on the floor, I probably wouldn't be smiling like they're smiling. But there's, that's their culture. And they had to carry in the water. Then they've got these plastic, these red and blue plastic containers, uh, and they're washing the dishes. But they're very happy because that's just a part of their culture. And then if we go to marketplace, sometimes we have market days in where we live. Uh, well, they have their market days, and they put a big blanket down on the floor, and then everything is put on the floor, a little bit different than the way we do it. And then up in the, this mountain range, it's called Kache. The language that they speak is Kache. Uh, other parts, they speak Spanish, such as Gloria a Dios. But when I'm up there, I also have to have two interpreters, English to Spanish and then Spanish to Kache. So you can see it's really important that I have excellent interpreters so that people are able to understand the language. And every meeting I ever go to, all these countries, it's always been so, so fruitful. So many people saved, healed, delivered, set free. Now let's look at the next picture. This is a picture up in the Arctic. I was preaching up in the Arctic with the Eskimos. Uh, 
their temperature is a little bit different. <laughs> they had a heat wave of 50 below one day, and uh, they thought it was quite nice. Opened their, they even opened their windows. I thought, now that does not compute with me. <laughs> but, um, and the Eskimos, they use a lot of stuff from the whales, but they have mukluks on their feet, very colorful, uh, very friendly people. Um, and then the middle picture is a lady standing by a one-man igloo. Now, we have a Bible school in the church where I go, and when people come to our Bible school, they have to move and live where the Bible school is. Just like when we went to Tulsa, we had to move to Tulsa to go to Bible school. Well, these students also have to move from where they live to this place to go to the Bible school. But she wanted to show me a one-man igloo, and I asked her where she lives. Where's her home? Where did she move from? She moved from the North Pole, and her name is Susie, and I thought... Susie from the North Pole. <laughs> I said, I've never met anybody from the North Pole. I said, I thought only Santa Claus lived there. She said, oh, no, we're all up there with Santa Claus. We, she said, we have a big family igloo. And uh, then um, I had my first dog, actually my first and my last uh, dog sled ride up there. I, I, I know how to tell a horse to stop, but I wasn't too confident when that there was dogs when they take off. And then the language that they speak there in this uh, region is called Anuktitut. And it's a sign language, and I have written down the sign language, and that word says, or it's the name of a song, I surrender all. And that's what it looks like in Anuktitut. But uh, again, I had to have very, very good translators, interpreters when I'm preaching over there. So let's just imagine now that I'm going to go back to the Arctic. I'm going to have an evangelistic crusade, and I'm going to have a, we're going to have some construction work and build the Eskimos some homes. And maybe some of you would like to come with me. So let's take a look at the next slide. So here we are, we're back in the Arctic, and uh, we're having a wonderful time and uh, doing some buildings. And so one day the Eskimo comes out and she wants to see the house that we built for her. And she finds a mud hut. That does not compute with her. She does not want to live in a mud hut in the Arctic. And then we're having the evangelistic crusade. And my translator begins to translate me into Spanish instead of K'iche'. So our, instead of a nook to took. So nobody is going to understand the meeting. No, there's nobody that wants to live in the mud hut. So this trip would be a complete failure. Reason being, we mixed the culture. You cannot mix cultures. Now I want you to turn to the next slide. We're going to talk about mixed cultures. Now, heaven, heaven has a culture, amen? And heaven's culture, praise the Lord, is eternal life, victorious life, justification, joy, praise, delivered, we're set free, peace of mind, agape love, healing, and wholeness. That's all a part of heaven's culture. Now, let's look at the next slide. Well, let me stay right there for just one moment. Go back there. Heaven's culture has its own language. And the language of heaven's culture is the language of faith. And heaven's culture, the language of faith, always says, it is written. Let's look at the next picture. This one is the world's culture. The world's culture is quite different. Eternal death, defeat condemnation, worry, confusion, fear, anxiety, negative attitudes, anger, hatred, sickness, and disease. A lot of things are part of the world's culture that's quite different than ours, right? Condemnation, worry, confusion, fear, anxiety, negative attitudes, sickness, and disease. That's a part of the world's culture not heaven's culture. And the language of the world is fear, doubt, and unbelief. Fear, doubt, and unbelief. Now, you and I are in this world, but we are not of this world. However, we have to make sure that we stay in our own culture every day. We have to cooperate with heaven's culture. You know, you can be saved, filled, but you will live a defeated life if you are mixing your culture. We cannot mix 
culture. We are citizens of heaven. We have to stay within our own culture. Amen. So I want us to look at the next slide. We're going to look, what does a mixed culture look like? So you come to church on Sunday. Can you see all that? We come to church on Sunday, uh, wonderful service, and you probably had a wonderful day on Saturday, and it's just been a great weekend, just a wonderful weekend. And then comes Monday. <laughs> Monday always shows up. Now, years ago, they used to talk about Monday, and they would call it a blue Monday. Anybody remember those days? Blue Monday. It was blue because it was a sad day because nobody wanted to go to work after having a wonderful weekend. And if you're not careful, you're going to join in with the people that you work with. They're talking about, oh, blue Monday. I sure don't wish I wasn't at work today. And then they'll start maybe complaining about their working conditions or different things. And then pretty soon you chime in, oh, yeah, I wish I wasn't at work today. And you might start talking. Pretty soon you're talking like they're talking. What have you just done? You mixed your culture. What do you need to do? During your lunch break, you need to go outside, go sit in your car, or go someplace where you are all alone, and you apply Jude 20. You start building yourself up in your most holy faith because we are to be the light of the world. And when you start having a, an attitude different than other people, your boss is going to notice that. The boss will notice that. When I first moved to California and I was working with a church, but they couldn't pay my salary, so I had to get a secular job. And one day, my boss's boss called me in the office and they said, You know, Marilyn, we really like the way you work. I mean, everything that you do just seems to be so excellent. Uh, what is it? What's different about you? And I just boldly said, well, everything I do, I do it as unto the Lord. He goes, oh, well, that's, that's really good. <laughs> you know? And he said, well, we really like you, and uh, we don't want to lose you. Now, he doesn't know that I'm praying every day to get the full time back in the church. But um, he said, we don't want to lose you, so what can we do for you? I said, mm, no, everything's fine. Said, no, I, I want to do something for you. He said, what do you need? Anything? I said, well, I could probably use a, a new printer. Oh, we're going to get you a new printer. What else would you like? Anything. I thought, well, that's an open door. <laughs> I said, well, well I, I guess I could use a, a raise. He said, oh, oh, no, no, we can't do any raises because they only come at the first of the year, and it all comes from corporate office in Chicago, and so we can't do that. He said, is there anything else? I said, no, the, the printer, that'd be fine. So he called me in a couple of weeks later. He says, the printer arrived. But you know what he did? I did, Marilyn. I don't want to lose you. So I called headquarters, and they agreed to give you a raise retroactive from January. And this was like the month of May. But then he said, but you know, I still want to do one other thing for you. And this meant more to me than anything. He said, I heard that you do prison ministry on Fridays. Now, I'm living in California, near Irvine, California. A lot of heavy traffic to go to work on a, any day of the week. He said, I'm going to change your work hours so that you don't have to deal with any traffic. Will that help you get into your prison ministry? I said, that would be really great. And that meant more to me that he changed my, I mean, it was a big corporation that I worked for. I was the only one that got a change in my hours to work, whatever fit me. I mean, that, that meant a lot to me. But see, he saw something different in me. He saw something different. And your boss needs to see that your light is shining. Amen. It really matters because otherwise you will get caught up in mixing your culture because the world, they live a defeated life. And then we talk about justification. We have been made the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. That, that, that is an unchangeable position. It's unchangeable. And so because we are made righteous, we have the privilege, we have the ability to stand in the presence of God without shame, without guilt, without condemnation, without inferiority. It is as though sin never happened. As far as the east is from the west, he removes our sins from us. And so we don't want to dwell on those when he doesn't even recall them. He does not remember them. But the devil wants you to remember them. So he will bring something to your mind, something that a mistake that you made, because he wants you to feel guilty, shameful, 
He wants you to feel unworthy. But we can't give place to those things because the battle is in the mind. And so it's so important that you always renew your mind and don't listen to the lies of the devil. He's always going to lie to you. Don't listen to those lies. You know, a number of years ago, and quite a number of years ago, I was, I was, it was when I was a teenager, quite a number of years ago, <laughs> but um, there was going to be this boxing match on television. Uh, everybody in the whole world was going to watch this box boxing match. I don't remember who these boxers were, but they were very, very well known. And so my dad and my brothers were going to watch the boxing match. I thought, well, I guess I'll sit down and watch the boxing match with them. So before the match started, they showed the interview of the two boxers that they had done the day before. And both those boxers were just shouting out these threats of what they're going to do to the other person. I'm going to punch him. I'm going to stop, you know. And they're just yelling out all these threats of what they're going to do to their opponent. And then they had the boxing match. And at the end of the match, now they interviewed both the boxers again. First, they interviewed the champion. And then they interviewed the one who lost. And they said, at what point did you realize you lost the battle? Round four, round six, when did you realize you lost the battle? I'll never forget what he said. He said, I didn't lose the battle in the ring. I lost the battle yesterday when I listened to his threats. He said, I should never have listened to those threats. Never listen to those lies of the devil. Never, never listen to them. You know, if you were to go... Um, to a restaurant, your favorite restaurant on a Friday night, 6 o'clock, you know that place is going to be packed. You could hear all, everybody says, jabber, jabber, jabber. You could hear all the voices. Even if you closed your eyes and you walked in there, you would hear all that noise. You know this place is packed because you can hear the voices. But when you go to sit down at your table, the voices are all, they're all still back there, but now you have turned your focus to the people at your table. You're only listening to the people at the table. Those voices are still out there. But you see, we need to learn to listen to the voice of the Lord. One time I was visiting my daughter, and my grandson was getting ready to go on the school bus, and he was forever leaving his jacket on the school bus. So now he's got another brand-new jacket. And she said to him, Now, Matthew, when you come home from school... Be, remember to bring your jacket home. And she said, are you listening to me? I said, yeah, Mom, I heard you. She said, no, I don't want to know if you heard me. I want to know, did you listen to me? See, there's a difference between hearing and listening. We need to listen to the voice of the Lord. Don't, don't pay attention. Those lies will be out there. You just put them under your feet. Amen. You need to learn to take negative thoughts captive at all times. And then we have joy. Praise, joy in the morning, praise. You know, the Bible says put on the garment of praise. That means it's not automatically there. You have to put it on. And, you know, sometimes we don't feel like singing or dancing or shouting. So the Bible also talks about a sacrifice of praise. There's times where you're not going to feel like it, but it's for your benefit because praise, thanksgiving, praise, and worship, that is our ministry to the Lord God Almighty. And he takes our praises, and it goes into the very spirit fabric of the Lord God Almighty, and you can never outgive God. That is our ministry to the Father. We're not asking for anything for us. We are giving him ministry. And that's the highest thing that you can give the Father God is thanksgiving, praise, and worship. And when he hears your praise, he inhabits those praises. And you can be sure whatever your need is, He'll show up because you can't outgive Father God. And but the but the world, remember, fear, doubt, unbelief, worry, anxiety, that's a part of the world's culture. You see how easy sometimes it is that we mix cultures? We don't even realize it. But when you're mixing your culture, you're still gonna be saved, still filled with the Holy Spirit, but you can live a defeated life. Why is the things not working for me? Or where am I missing it? It could be because you're living with a mixed culture. I don't want to be saved, filled, and defeated. I want to be saved, filled, and triumphant. Amen. So you can see how important it is. And then peace of mind. To me, 
Peace of mind in the midst of the storms is the highest form of prosperity next to salvation. If you can have peace in the midst of the storms of, the life, of your life, because we're all going to have those storms, right? But if you can have peace in the midst of the storm, that is the highest form of prosperity that you can have. But so many people, they live with fear, doubt, confusion. That is not a part of our culture. That's the world's culture. And if you start dealing with all these other issues, you're going to live a defeated life. You're going to wonder, why does, does it seem like the word isn't working for me? Or why am I missing it? See, we have to be so careful. Is this helping you today? That you're not going to be mixing your culture because it's so easy to do. Then walk in love. That is not an option. We have to stay in the love walk at all times. And sometimes you don't feel like forgiving somebody, but you do it in faith. Because it's, it's an act of faith that you forgive no matter what has happened to you. If Jesus can forgive us of our sins, we can surely forgive somebody for what they have done against us. Because faith only works by love. You know, it talks about uh, faith working by love. And, you know, we so often hear the scripture in Mark eleven twenty three. You're probably familiar with that scripture. That whoever says to this mountain... Be thou removed, and does not doubt in his heart. But he believes that those things that he saith shall come to pass. He will have whatever he says. But then in verse 25, But whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. You see, if we don't have faith to forgive just one offense, you'll never have faith to move a mountain. It's never going to happen. Because that mountain is any negative situation in your life. But if you don't have faith to forgive one person, I'm telling you, you'll never have faith to move a mountain. So we have to stay in the love walk at all times. And submission, sometimes people think submission is restriction. No, submission is protection. Your pastor is going to protect you from false doctrine. So you need to submit to those in authority over you. Amen. It's a wonderful place to be. It's a safe place. It's a very safe place to be. And, then be. and we hear so much about negative attitudes, and there is so much offense in the world today. You know, it says in Psalms 119, verse 165, Great peace have they who love my law, and nothing shall offend them. Offense is not an option. It does not belong to our culture. That goes back to staying in the love walk. And then sickness and disease. That doesn't belong to us. We have a covenant of healing. And so you need to learn how to understand healing and how to take your authority over those negative symptoms. You need to learn how to walk in divine health. Amen. I want to share with you some things about um, the language of faith in relationship to healing. The language of faith relies on what it believes, then speaks, and then receives. The language of faith ignites the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The language of faith speaks those things which be not as though they were. The language of faith is God's creative power. The language of faith gives substance of things hoped for and the evidence of victory not yet seen. It says in Isaiah 53, 5, that by his stripes you are healed. And in 1 Peter 2, 24, it says by his stripes you were healed. So if the Bible says you are and you were, then honey, you is. <laughs> That's not proper English, but if it says you are and you were, then you is. You see, we have to see ourselves as the Word of God says we are. Because the eye of faith sees first what the natural eye does not yet see. It sees first what the natural eye does not yet see. The language of faith always says what the Word of God says. You have to, you have to know what the Word says, and that's what you speak. It's, a, it's the language of faith. Now, the world's culture, they have their own language. It's the language of doubt and unbelief. The world's culture speaks repeatedly of the pain. The world's culture continually talks about the sickness, the disease, all the medication, all the surgeries, all the symptoms. 
the language of the world, the language of doubt and unbelief, it relies on what it sees. It relies on the five senses. The world's culture ignites the law of sin and death. In John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy through a mixed culture. That's not our culture. If you mix your culture, we can be defeated. Amen? We don't want to be defeated. We don't want to mix our culture. I want to live a victorious life. Amen? I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, verse 9. I want to show you something else. The Lord's telling me to do something here. In Matthew 6, verse 9, I'll do that, Lord. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For God's will to be done on the earth as it is in heaven is only going to happen through the language of faith. The language of faith has access to the kingdom of heaven and brings God's will into your life and my life all through the language of faith. Amen. God's will on the earth, the language of faith, it has access to the kingdom of heaven and brings God's will into your life, into my life. So if we want to experience God's will in our life, we have to cooperate with our own culture. We have to cooperate with heaven's culture, with the language of faith. In Deuteronomy 30, 19. Deuteronomy 30, 19. It says, I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Choose what? Choose life. Who does the choosing? We do the choosing. I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Choose life. You know, Catherine Coleman once said, the only limit to the power of God lies within the individual. It's all on what they choose. The only limit to the power of God lies within the individual. We can choose life and blessings, or we can live a defeated life. Amen. In Proverbs 18.21, Proverbs 18.21, if you can turn there. Death and life, or you could also say sickness and health, are in the power of of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death, listen to me carefully, death is not in the power of cancer. Death is not in the power of COVID. Death is in the power of the tongue. No matter what it is, death is in the power of the tongue. And if you're in fear, fear activates the things that you don't want. It activates the world's culture. So power is and it's so important. It's the power of the tongue. Power, that word power indicates force. Power is a force. Now, power can exist without being activated. For example, when everybody goes home today, someone's going to turn off the light switch. So then it will be dark in here. But nobody is going to call the power company to disconnect the power. The power will still be here, but it won't be activated. So power in itself can do nothing until it's been activated. Faith is a force. Faith can exist without being activated. Faith in itself can do nothing until it's been activated. In James chapter 2, it says, faith without works is dead. In the King James Version, it says, even so faith, if, ha if it has not works, it's dead because it's all alone. Faith was never to be all alone. 
The Amplified says, So also faith, if it does not have works, deeds, or actions of obedience to back it up, by itself it is destitute of power. It is inoperative. It is dead. The New Living Translation says, So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead, it is useless. Now, let's just imagine for a moment that um, I saw somebody that was very, very poor, and they had no shoes to keep their feet warm or protect their feet, so I give them shoes, but they never wear the shoes. They may as well not even have the shoes, because now those shoes are useless. But they had shoes, but they never used them. So the shoes are absolutely useless. God has given every one of us faith. But if we don't use the faith, might as well not even have it. We have to use our faith. And it's easy. You just choose to believe. You just choose to believe. It's not meant to be a difficult thing. Going back to Proverbs 18, 21. In the Hebrew language, the word um, tongue, it's, 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 it's very, the Hebrew language is very graphic. Let me say it like this, very graphic. And it pictures the tongue just like a hand. Now, my hand has the ability to pick up this bottle of water and put it down. I can take this bottle of water and I can turn it all around with my hand. That word tongue has the power. Power has, it's like using a tongue. Now, I'm going to ask Rick to do something for me. I'm going to ask Rick, or maybe you can just bring up this chair. I want everybody to watch Rick. He's going to bring a chair up here. Watch him very carefully. You could just put it right here. Then you can stay right here with me. Now, did you notice that when he brought that chair up here, he didn't pick it up with his feet? He didn't use his nose. He used his hand. Now, Rick, take the chair and turn it completely around. His hand had the power to take that chair and turn it completely around. Your tongue has the power to speak to any and every situation and turn it completely around. Amen. Thank you, Rick. That is so powerful. And you understand the power of the tongue can turn, I'm done, (laughs) can turn your situation around. So the words that you and I speak have the power to grasp or to release matters of life, matters of death. And then it goes on to say in Proverbs, in the second portion of that scripture, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. The phrase, its fruit, indicates the spoken word. It's also like planting a seed. You're going to plant a seed of death or life, sickness or health, poverty, prosperity. Speech becomes seeds planted in the spirit realm. And seeds of truth or dishonest speech, they will all produce fruit. So don't plant what you don't want to harvest. Don't speak what you don't want because you are planting something. When I lived in Nebraska, I had a a huge garden. I lived way out in the country and I had a huge garden. My favorite thing was to my homegrown tomato plants. (laughs) And after I planted the whole row of tomato plants, I would stand back and just take a look and I wanted to make sure my row was real straight. Well, there'd always be maybe one tomato plant that was just not quite in line. So I went out there, and I would uproot that tomato plant. And I would just tweak it over so that it was right in line. And then everything was just right in line. Well, I'm always asking the Holy Spirit, if I say something that's contrary to your word or something that displeases you, just check my spirit. Just tell me, just give, give me a check. And he'll do it all the time. And as soon as I get that check, I realize I just planted a seed that I don't want to harvest. So I, I want to uproot that seed. And I do it simply by, Lord, I repent of that negative seed I just planted. I uproot that seed for it is written. And then I decree what is written about that situation. So we can uproot those negative seeds that we planted. Just uproot them. It's not a difficult thing. We just do it right. Amen. 
In Revelations 12, 11 says, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Our testimony is simply our agreement with what the word of God says. See, we have to see ourselves as the word says. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 24, turn there. Proverbs 4, 24. It says, put away from you a deceitful mouth and perverse lips. Perverse lips means the misuse of the tongue. A deceitful mouth speaks an untruth. What's another word for an untruth? A lie. Dishonest speech. One thing that God hates is a lying tongue. In Proverbs 6.16, 6, it says that God hates, one of the things that God hates is a lying tongue. So every time you and I say something contrary to the word of God, God is probably up in heaven thinking, I wish my children would stop telling lies. Yes. You know, we teach our little children not to lie. Well, we are God's children. Yes. And every time we say something opposite to what he says about our situation, he says, that's a lie. We can go around, and, oh, my back is killing me. My arthritis is acting up. Oh, my sinuses. Oh, my goodness, my sinuses. I just don't know if I can make it through the day with these sinuses. And so you're just complaining. God said, that's a lie. That is a lie. I said I healed your back. I said you were healed of arthritis. I said you're healed of, of uh, all those things. We're, we're healed of it all. But if we keep saying, you snare yourself with your own words, if you keep mixing your culture, because the Bible says you will have what you say. If you keep saying, oh, my, my arthritis, my weak kidneys, my um, whatever it is, you're, you're taking ownership of something that doesn't belong to you. And God, I mean, you imagine how it grieves the Lord. He said, I wish my children would stop telling lies and come into agreement with what I have said about their situation. Because you do snare yourself with the words of your mouth. He says in Proverbs 21, 23, you don't have to turn there, but he says, he who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. You know, in Proverbs, uh, Psalms 45, 1, the tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You know, we have to stay with the language of our culture, the language of faith. I have a glass of water here, and it's good, pure water. Now, let's just imagine I am so thirsty, so thirsty, that this half a glass of water, that's not going to quench my thirst. I want, a, I want a full glass of water. But I didn't see any water around me, but I, then I see, oh, here's a bottle of something. Ah, uh, hmm, Clorox. That's okay. I can drink that. So I pour that Clorox in there. Is that going to be safe to drink? Mm -mm. Well, maybe I'll think, well, I'll just drink the pure part of the water, and I, I won't drink the Clorox part. Am I able to do that? No, because that Clorox contaminated the pure water. It is no longer safe for me to drink. I can't just decide, well, I'll drink the pure part and leave the Clorox there. It's not going to happen. Well, so it is with faith. We have been given the measure of faith. But you can contaminate your faith. You can weaken your faith through fear, doubt, unbelief by mixing the world's culture with your faith. And you might think, well, I'll just, I can use my faith over here, but, uh, you know, I, I do have fear on that, on that situation. No, no. Fear will contaminate your faith. It will weaken your faith. And your faith will not be able to do what you need it to do in a very specific situation if it's been contaminated. It has now been weakened. So it's so important that we stay within our own culture. Is this helping you today? Yeah. Helping you to see, but well, maybe this is where I missed it because if you know where you missed it, you can make the adjustment, get right back on track because none of us have arrived. None of us are perfect, but that's the part of the Holy Spirit that he helps you to keep on track. So when you ask the Lord, Lord, if I'm saying something wrong, just beep, beep, beep. Just let me know. Let me know what I've done wrong. <laughs> you know, when you drive your car, when you drive a car, we know that we are supposed to stop at a red light. Would you agree? <laughs> and you go in a green light. But if you drive through a red light, 
You could have a head-on collision. Head-on collision. Well, the Holy Spirit is our helper. He lives on the inside of us. It says in John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all the truth. And he will not speak on his own authority. He will only speak what he hears the Father tell him to say. And he will show us things to come. So he will let you know, don't go over there. That's a red light. Here's a green light. You know, sometimes you thought, well, I think I'm going to go um, on this vacation with my friends, or you're go you've got a special event you're going to go to, and, and you've planned it for months and months, and then you think, hmm, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to go. And you tell your friends, oh, I'm not going to go. And you're, well, your friend is disappointed. Oh, come on. We've planned it for so long. No, I'm not going to go. Oh, please. No, I'm not going to go. I'm just not going to go. I'll buy lunch. Well, okay. <laughs> so we go. Well, when we were there, something happened. And we should not have been there or we should have been at home. And after all the dust settles, you think back, hmm, I knew it. I knew it. I knew I shouldn't have gone. After all the dust settles, you think, I knew it. Well, what happened? The Holy Spirit was speaking to you, but you violated the leading of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when something negative happens to somebody, they say, I wonder why God let that happen. That's the wrong question. The right question is, who just went through the red light? Who went through the red light? It wasn't Jesus. He gave you a green light, but you didn't get it. You went through the red light. So that's why you want to you wanna spend a lot of time with the Lord. Spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. Build yourself up. It helps you to be more in tune with Father God so that you don't go through so many red lights. Because we've all, how many, I've, I've gone through some red lights. Have any of you ever gone through a red light? And I'm talking about in the spiritual realm. Because you can have a head-on collision spiritually, which eventually could even cause a natural spiritual collision, or a collision that could cause death. So we want to be so in tune with the Father. So the language of faith, in closing, the language of faith cannot be reduced to positive speaking. It is not positive speaking. Positive speaking is good and it has its place and it can motivate people. But positive speaking will never move the hand of God. It will never move the hand of God. Only the language of faith has access to the kingdom of heaven and brings God's will into your life, into my life, into the earth. Only the language of faith. We can't mix our culture. I can't speak Spanish in the Arctic and expect people to respond to the altar call. I can't speak German in a Chinese restaurant and expect to get apple strudel. It's not going to happen. As a citizen of heaven, I cannot speak the world's language and expect heaven's results. It's not going to happen. And as a citizen of heaven, we don't need an interpreter. Because the language of faith is our native tongue. It's our native tongue. Amen. So we want to stay within our own culture. Amen. And speak your own language. So I'd like to ask if there's anybody here today, if you're not a citizen of heaven, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, or maybe those that are watching on live stream, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, uh, you can do that today. And that is the greatest miracle you'll ever have because that's when your life, you're, you've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are guaranteed two things. You are guaranteed, one, that when you leave this earth, you will live in heaven with Father God forever and ever and ever. The other thing you are guaranteed is that when you, uh, while you are on this earth, the Holy Spirit will come and live on the inside of you to guide you, to direct you, to protect you in Jesus' name. So if there's anybody here, you've never asked Jesus into your heart, I want you just to raise your hand. Anybody at all? Anybody at all? I would encourage you, you probably all know somebody who's not a citizen of heaven. Invite them to church. Invite them to church. And if you're listening on a line, online, let's just pray corporately because there could be somebody listening online that they today want to ask Jesus to come into your heart. So let's just do this corporately. And you pray with me. Dear Father God, and if you're listening online, just pray this with us. Dear God, I thank you for Jesus. I ask you to come into my life. Teach me your ways. Fill me with your spirit. 
I receive you now as my personal Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and teach me your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.